Greetings, my fellow scholars of the live stream. I'm Mizuasat from the Cosmo Canyon Observatory, and in today's analysis, we'll dive into all the in game menu screens we've seen thus far. The gameplay stage demo at TGS 2019 treated us with a glimpse of the main menu and the options page, while the batch of 21 screenshots, published shortly after TGS ended, contained a phenomenal display of the equipment and material menu screen. But before we start, special thanks to my new patrons Dazed Scholar, John Run 2000, All Out of Bubblegum, Afthor Imsland, and PC. You guys are the best! Additionally, big thanks to our special supporter Nanaki, who upgraded to our new tier named after the beloved four legged companion. Patrons of the Nanaki tier or higher get a two day early access of a preview version of any upcoming video and receive the opportunity to provide feedback, which I then can integrate into the final release. If you'd like to join the Scholar of the Livestream Elite as well, please check out the links to my Patreon and Subscribestar pages in the description down below. And if you're interested in being part of the conversation, head over to our Discord server to meet the other awesome scholars and engage in deep discussions. With that being said, let's cease the daily dallying and dive straight into the UI craze. We'll start off with the main menu screen. Its main color is still blue, just like in the original. However, it is semi-transparent, so that the game is still visible behind. Here, we are at the bottom of the reactor core, just a few steps away from the pump regulator, where the battle against the Scorpion Sentinel will ensue. As we'll see during the TGS stage presentation, the game completely freezes when entering the menu. And if we look very closely, we see an interesting menu transition. It starts off with a zoom blur, then a cross appears in the middle, turning 45 degrees to the right, two enlarging squares appear, then the menu borders fly in, followed by a zooming in background rectangle, which is accompanied by the main menu entries. And then finally all the other elements appear, followed by the characters and their status elements. On the upper left we see a very nice galaxy animation in the background. Is this a parallel to the star field in the intro? Near both the left and the right upper corner we see several animated dots in the background. Fortunately it's quite subtle, so it doesn't interfere with the user experience. All the other dots and menu elements are static. However, there are those strange rectangles that disappear and appear again when navigating between submenus. Do you see it here? I have no idea what their purpose is, so I guess it's just for visual eye candy. Now let's shift our attention to the characters. What we see here are parts of the full body renders that have been already released to the public. Cloud's face and head orientation looks very similar to his face art seen in the original menu. Barrett on the other hand looks very similar to his full body artwork. There's even this slight head tilt. Compared to Cloud, his menu face art is quite different. It's interesting that Barrett doesn't wear his glasses here. I hope they fix this for the final build. Now let's have a look at all the UI elements. On the very left, we see where we currently are, in this case in the main menu. And on the bottom left, we see the current game time and the guild funds. However, the overlap with the command menu in the background is quite unfortunate. What's interesting is that the icons are quite similar to Final Fantasy XIII and also Final Fantasy XV, though the gill icon is a little different in the latter. But maybe those icons are just temporary and not finalized yet and will change for the final build. What I really like is the shortcut to the save menu. In the bottom right, it tells us that we can press triangle for saving our game. This also suggests that we can save everywhere. Would be really neat and handy if this was the case. Let's hope it is. Different than the original, the menu items are on the left, not on the right. And here we see 7 items total. Is this just a coincidence? At least there's one improvement over the original and that's the menu description at the bottom. In the character area we see there's room for one more. I tried to place a fourth one, but then it gets really cramped. So I think 3 is the maximum here. Like the menu location text, the character names are also oriented vertically. Speaking of location, it seems like they removed this. The original always told us where we were. Let's hope this feature returns in the final build. Anyway, back to the characters. I also like how the last name is smaller than the first name. What's new here is the battle leader designation. This tells us which character we'll control at the start of the battle. Since it explicitly says battle leader, I think this only applies to battle and not the exploration mode. Except in certain situations where we seem to control other characters, as seen in the TGS 2019 trailer. The character status area seems to have a 45 degrees design applied to it. The lines also have an echo shifted to the right. But why are there dots on either side of the HP value? And why is there a line only underneath the MP value? 
and there's no percentage bar visible either. Quite peculiar. But overall, it shows the same information as seen in the original. But there are a few differences. There are additional experience points numbers visible for one, and for the other, the limit bars are missing. When we look at the demo footage, every single battle starts off with the characters having an empty limit bar. So it seems like the limit bar resets after each battle, but also prevents the player from saving it up for the next boss battle. Which is kind of a shame on one hand, but on the other, it does make sense from a balancing perspective. This way, the boss battles cannot be cheesed through by hoarding limit breaks. Below the MP numbers, there is still quite a lot of empty space. Is it reserved for certain status effects transcending battles? Is the equipped summon visible there? Or something else? It could also be just emptiness. The level progression seems to have been preserved. As we've seen in footage and other screenshots, Cloud starts off at level 6 with 966 HP. Then he levels up to level 7, increasing his max HP to 1026. What's also worth of note here is that every letter is uppercase. This seems to be consistent across all the Japanese footage. In the English version of the footage we've seen thus far, all the text contains the correct casing. And it seems like the UI designer likes squares standing on one edge. If we look closely, we can find it practically everywhere. In each corner of rectangles, at the end of lines, it acts as a separator between option and value, part of it is in the background behind level and experience points, it's found in the in-game compass, and it also acts as a target indicator for enemies. Now let's have a look at the menu items. I find it quite strange that battle settings and enemy report appear at the top. Why not items or magic? Items and magic are also swapped when comparing to the original. And I also don't understand why save and load received its own menu item. Why can't they just put both options in the system menu? It only contains options in the title anyway. Maybe the only reason is to have 7 menu items at the start of the game. And what I also find a bit strange is the angled shadow behind the menu items. I don't really see a reason for those to be there. At least they're not distracting in any way. We're also missing a few items, but those won't be available anyway for quite some time. The first is equipment and materia, which will probably only be accessible after the tutorial in 7th Heaven. And then there's the PHS or party menu, which I have doubts we'll ever see it in the first game, as we'll have access to more than three characters at a time only during the Shinra HQ raid, which is at the very end of the game anyway. The limit menu is also missing, but this one could now be integrated under battle settings. Let's now have a look at the individual menu items. The description for battle settings says the following. Set your shortcut commands and change the battle settings. This of course covers setting up the commands for your shortcut menu, and the other battle settings probably consist of selecting the battle leader, the AI behavior, and probably also limit break settings. The enemy report description says the following. Check enemy information. This will most likely contain a list of all defeated enemies, with rotatable and zoomable 3D models, and all of the enemy's stats, strength, weaknesses, drops, steal rates, and so on. Discovering the information could work the same as in Final Fantasy XIII, where we either had to use Libra on the enemy, or find out resistances and weaknesses by just attacking them. The magic menu description says, check your required magic. I think this is practically the same as in the original, where we can check all the learned magic and also use restorative magic. Next up is the item menu, and its description says, use items or check the items you have on you. I find it interesting that they mention use items specifically, and not use magic. So we probably can't use magic in the main menu. But fortunately, we have access to the commands menu while exploring, so we can use our restorative magic from there. The status menu description says, check party member status. This is most likely largely the same as in the original, which contained all the stats, strength, weaknesses, equipment, and so on. In the remake, we most likely also get the full body render, along with a character bio, which might get more information as the story progresses. The save and load description says, save or load your game here. I still think it should be part of the systems menu, especially since we can save our game directly by pressing triangle. The description of the system menu says, change settings for play environment, download DLC content, and use all different type of functions. So far, it only contains the options menu and the title menu which most likely takes us back to the title screen. Of course, the DLC menu is not visible yet. I'm sure it will be added for the final build, especially since we need a way to redeem the codes for the special editions and pre-order summons. Alright, that's about it for the main menu. Special thanks to Yakura Koki, who translated all the menu text for me. Thanks, my friend! And here we have the options menu. 
which is divided into four main categories. Gameplay settings, camera and control settings, sound settings and language settings. The triangle command at the bottom right says reset all settings. I'm not sure if many players will use this feature, but it's convenient nonetheless. The gameplay settings is the only submenu we see here, so we'll have to focus on that one. The description at the bottom says change battle settings, map navigation and many more options. And upon entering the submenu, we see the following options. Battle difficulty, which is set to normal, remember cursor location for main menu, which is set to no memory, as well as remember cursor location for battles. We also had those settings in the original game, but this is nothing new here. Then we have navigation map, which is set to stationary. This is a common setting for minimaps, where the orientation either matches the camera or always points to north. I personally prefer the stationary option. The next one is language setting, which is set to speaker and lines. Here we can enable and disable subtitles as well as the name of the speaker. And then there's the talk lock setting, which is also set to speaker and lines, but I'm not really sure what this means. Are we able to pause and scroll back through the dialogue? This would be pretty neat. I can't think of anything else that would be called talk lock. The next one is a standard accessibility feature and is called font size, which is set to standard. This will probably control the font size of dialogue and menu text. This is a really nice feature which helps the visual impaired and also for less players and streamers whose audiences sometimes watch on a small screen. And last but not least, the battle guide. It's set to do not show, which is the exact opposite setting they used in the E3 stage demonstration, where we could see the button layout help in most of the footage. This was also a feature in Final Fantasy XV. We don't see the content of the other three categories, so let's just mention them briefly. For camera and controller settings, I don't think I have to explain anything, but I hope to give us the option to invert the X and Y axis, and also the possibility to remap all the buttons. The sound settings are most likely also pretty standard, with different volume sliders and the choice between stereo and surround options. The language setting is also self-explanatory. We should be able to switch between Japanese, English, German, French and of course many more languages for the text. Now let's return to the difficulty modes. We have Normal, Easy and Classic. The description for Normal says, This mode is suitable when you want to fully enjoy the battle. This is the standard difficulty. For Easy it says, This setting is suitable when you want to focus on the story. This is the easy difficulty. And for classic, it says the action is controlled automatically. You only control the commands. And this is where it gets interesting. This mode has been shown extensively in the TGS 2019 stage demonstration and it has also been explained later on Twitter, but for those who are still not in the know, I will briefly summarize how it works. When the classic difficulty mode is engaged, all the action elements are handled automatically by the AI. So even the character you're currently in control of is handled like an AI companion. The character will automatically move around, attack, block and dodge. All you have to do is open the commands menu when at least one ATB bar is full and choose a command to execute. This practically turns Final Fantasy VII Remake's battle system into a turn-based system. There are still some differences, but they are minute and negligible. Like in the original game, you will wait until the ATB bar is full and then choose a command to attack. The difference is your character will also do some damage in between. Alright, that's it for the difficulty options. I just hope there will be a hard option down the line, like Critical Mode in Kingdom Hearts 3. And now comes the best screenshot of all time! I was very ecstatic when I saw this for the first time. Too bad I didn't record my reaction to it. Anyway, this screenshot is proof that the equipment and material system functions practically the same as in the original. Let's dive into the details. The first plus is that equipment and materia are now located on the same submenu screen. No more switching with the square button, nice! Let's go over all the elements first. As with all the other menus, the menu name is placed vertically on the left side. Then we have the active character's name on the top left, with L2 and R2 for switching between characters. The first area contains the equipment, though I find it strange that the caption says weapon and not equipment, since the weapon makes up only one third of the section. The next section contains all the material slots, for the weapon and the armor, like in the original game. And we can also still remove material from slots by pressing square. The third section contains the character's attributes, which consists of level, HP, MP and all the stats. And in the middle at the top, we see name and information of the selected item, in this case the elemental material. On the right, we have the information card, which contains more details about the selected item. And in the middle of the screen, we see a large 3D representation of the selected item. 
And again, the beginning and end of a line, as well as all the corners of the rectangles, bear the same square standing on one corner. Even the icons of the equipment slots and the selected item are contained within the same shape. Let's now have a look at the equipment. As we can see, we still have the same equipment slots as in the original. The character-specific weapon, the armor, which is mostly a bangle, and the accessory. The icons seem to be independent of the equipped item, as the power race guards certainly do not look like a necklace. Maybe this will change in the final build, but for now, those are generic representations of the equipment slot. The weapon icon, however, will most likely be different for each character. This was also the case in the original game. What's curious is that the Buster Sword is highlighted in blue. Now why is that? I can see three different possibilities. Either it's just meant to differentiate the weapon from the other equipment types, or it's highlighted because a weapon material slot is selected. But there's also a third option. Weapon upgrades. In most other games that have weapon upgrades, those upgrades are color-coded. Equipment might be upgradable, and the Buster Sword has been upgraded to level 2. And if we upgrade it further, it might turn green, yellow, orange, red and finally purple. Who knows? Next up are the slots. As mentioned before, the remake recreates the classic material slot system quite nicely. We have single and linked slots for weapons and armor. What's new, however, is that linked slots are glowing when the combination is a valid one. What's also new is the dedicated summon material slot. And it doesn't seem to be part of the weapon, as the Buster Sword only has two slots. But where does the material go? My second thought was right into the body, which would explain why each character can equip only one summon. This idea of course comes from the movie Athens Children, where Kadaj, one of the antagonists, absorbs the summon material to summon Bahamut Sin. However, when Cloud summons Ifrit during the apps battle, all the material slotted into the hard edge are glowing. So it might be just an invisible slot. Anyway, by adding more slots, we see that the number of weapon slots only goes up to 6. While the number of armor slots could potentially go up to 9. However, certain weapons might even have a 7th slot, providing the possibility to link a support material to the summon material. I'd really like that. In this screenshot, the blue elemental material is selected and the selection indicator even has some similarities to the locked-on targeting reticle when in battle. Let's move on to the character stats. As mentioned before, it shows the level, current and maximum HP and MP, and all of the primary and derived stats. The primary stats, strength, magic, vitality, spirit, luck and speed are essentially the same as in the original, just ordered and named a little bit differently. Then we have the derived stats, attack, defense, magic attack and magic defense. The derived stats are calculated by adding the equipment bonus to the primary stats. Stat bonuses and penalties by materia will most likely also be added to the derived stats. It's barely noticeable, but every other row has a lighter background. What's also interesting to note here is that there's still some empty room to the right. I think that space is reserved for visual stat changes while selecting equipment and materia. What's missing, however, are the percentile stats for attack, defense and magic defense. But since we're dealing with an action RPG, hit percent chances aren't really part of the equation anymore, which is why they got rid of those stats. Let's shift our focus to the selected item, in this case the elemental materia. On the top we have the following information. The icon and the name, the name of the character which currently has the item equipped, and some item-specific information. In the case of the elemental materia, that's the star level, the current AP and the AP number needed for level up, as well as the AP progress bar, and lastly, there's the description. Adds the elements to the linked material to your equipment. Which is exactly how the elemental material worked in the original game. What's changed, however, is that the icon and the level stars don't bear the material color anymore. Additionally, the remake is missing the fourth star level for mastering the elemental material. Does that mean we can no longer master and therefore duplicate material? I hope there will be a different way to master material or that a new material is born when hitting level 3. Not sure how I feel about this yet. In addition to the basic information on the top, there's the detailed information on the right. For Materia, we have a preview, which shows how its effect works. In this specific instance, we see how the ice element takes shape on the weapon. But I wonder, is this a generic display or does it change depending on which Materia it's linked to? It would be pretty cool. Also, does it have another preview when slotted into the armor? Besides a repetition of the name, we get a detailed description of how each level works. In this case, level 1 adds 2% linked elemental damage, level 2 adds 4% and level 3 adds 5%. And if the elemental material is linked in the armor slot, it halves the linked elemental damage on level 1, prevents it completely on level 2 and even absorbs it on level 3. 
this is exactly how it works in the original game. However, the weapon effect is kinda different. In the original, the whole damage turned into elemental damage. Here, it works very differently. From the description, adding damage sounds like adding X% percent on top of the normal damage, which is then doubled, halved, negated or absorbed, depending on a target's elemental properties. Let's take a hit of 100 damage for example. When linking an elemental material level 3 to a fire material, this equals a 5% additional damage, resulting in 105 damage. If the enemy is weak against fire, it results in 110 damage. If the enemy is resistant to fire, it drops to 102 damage, rounded down. If the enemy is immune, the elemental bonus is negated, keeping the damage at 100. If the enemy absorbs the fire element, the attack will still deal 100 points of damage, but the 5 elemental points of damage will be converted into healing, resulting in 95 points of damage. This seems rather minuscule. My guess is that due to a potentially large number of hits, the elemental effect would be either overpowered, the attack would become useless or potentially completely heal the target if the full attack damage was elemental. The elemental damage is considered a nice bonus or a slight penalty, as to not diminish the standard attack, which is the primary source for ATB. And just equipping an elemental combination provides an advantage. There's an automatic damage bonus if the target is either resistant or not affected by the element at all. Going back to the displayed information, stat changes aren't visible anymore. At least not within the detailed information window. If a piece of equipment was selected, this detailed information window might describe the additional effects, and if upgrading equipment is a thing, it might also describe the effects for each level. Now let's have a look at the space in the middle. Behind the 3D model of the selected item, we see several circles around it, accompanied by galaxy nebula imagery, the same as in the upper left area of the screen. I don't think those circles mean anything and just happen to look nice around the support material. I wonder if we're able to rotate the 3D models of the Buster Sword, Iron Bangle, Power Race Guards and all the other equipment and material. Would be pretty neat. But other than the 3D representation, I think the space in the middle is used for something different. Namely the selection list. When selecting and confirming a piece of equipment or material, I think the selection window will appear in the middle, allowing us to select the item we want to equip. And while moving around the cursor in the selection window, I also think we see the stat changes for attack, defense, magic attack, magic defense, depending on the stat bonuses and penalties of equipment and material. Alright, to round up this analysis, let's take a look at the background. Here, the player seems to run along the tunnel to sector 5. And judging by the curvature, we're still in the spiral of the central pillar of Midgar. Specifically between jumping off the train and entering the service area next to the checkpoint. Having a closer look, this tunnel is practically identical to the one seen in the bike chase minigame. And it's also very similar to the original render. We have the red tube lights on the walls, the two railways, the curve to the right, as well as the lights on the ceiling, although they have been shifted to the edges. And on the right, we see the entrance to a side area. There's a fence and a small staircase, potentially leading to a chest or even an optional area. And in the middle, we can even see parts of the Buster Sword. What I find a bit peculiar are the playtime and the gale funds. Either the player has been speedrunning all the way to this place, or they started a debug session at the beginning of the second bombing mission. Even the first bombing mission demonstration had a higher play time. And gill funds of exactly 2000 also seems fishy to me. That's why I think they started a debug session with the default inventory and equipment for this particular point in the game. Having 3 digits for the hour component kinda makes me wonder if they anticipate over 100 hours of gameplay for completionists. What I also find a little bit confusing is the location in the preview screen. This seems to depict the Sector 7 sewers, but here we're far away from that point in the game, so I hope this will change in the final build of the game. Regarding equipment availability, the Iron Bangle can be bought in Sector 7, so it makes sense to have this one equipped here. The Power Risk Guards on the other hand was first available as a drop by Bottom Swell, the boss at the beaches of Lower Junon. And it's also called Power Wrist in the original and not Power Wrist Guards. Accessories in general weren't available until Shinra HQ, like the Star Pendant, Power Vest and the Talisman. Naturally, those now have to move locations, as many other weapons and armor also will have to do to provide a balanced experience. This also applies to the elemental materia, as it was also first obtained in Shinra HQ. And since we have already a summon materia available, this is more evidence that the battle against the Sweeper alongside Ifrit happens before the second bombing mission, which I theorize is part of the new side mission with the Avalanche Trio, Jesse, Biggs and Wedge. But more on that in another video. And with this little preview also ends our analysis for today. 
The next episode's content will be chosen by my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar of The Apprentice tier or above, and will be announced on Twitter, Mines and Discord shortly. Currently, it looks like the next episode will cover what you're now seeing on screen. Alright, let us know if there are details we've missed and please don't hesitate to speak your mind. Let's have a discussion in the comment section down below. Leave a like, subscribe if you're new, hit the bell button to be notified of future uploads and don't let yourself stop from sharing this video around. That being said, thank you so much for attending this analysis and I hope to see you again in the next episode of Game Analysis. And always remember, stay safe and take care. Bisuwasat, signing off. Thank you.